Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Alan Van Capel, President and CEO of the Educational Alliance, an organization that was founded in 1889 as a settlement house for Jewish immigrants and has taken on a completely new character in the, in the intervening years. Alan has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Alan, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I started off by saying that it was a completely new character or a completely evolved character, but that's not entirely correct. Talk about the Educational Alliance as it was founded and then talk about how it works today. Yeah, I mean, when it was founded, um, there were all these very wealthy and assimilated uh, German Jews who were living on the Upper East Side who suddenly one day look south and they see all of their Eastern European cousins arriving in Manhattan. And they go, my God. And they living in squalor. Yes, they look nothing like us. But they are from the same cloth. And they called them country. They thought they were uneducated. They didn't speak uh, good English if they spoke English at all. They didn't have a foundation in the arts as they would have liked them to have. And so one night, a few of them got together and they started this education alliance. And they said, if we can give people education, we can give them a job, we can teach them better English, then they could settle and assimilate um, in New York and hopefully launch them into the middle class. And four million people later, the Educational Alliance still continues to do very similar work, um, but we've been situated on the same corner of Manhattan um, for our entirety. And so whoever's living in that neighborhood has been getting served by us. So the mission has stayed relatively the same. The populations of people coming into the organization have just shifted with time. So one of the things that I love about that story is that it, the, it is the definition of self. It starts off as a self-help organization for a community of people who self-identify with a particular group. And as time has passed, that what who self is, who we are, mm. becomes a larger and larger and larger circle until we is truly we. It, it, it reflects the diversity of the city. I think it's, it's somewhat the best spirit of New York. You know, New Yorkers, uh, feel an obligation uh, to one another in a way that I haven't experienced in many other places. Um, and I think that spirit of saying it's not a handout, if you're willing to come and work hard, mm -hmm. um, we can help level the playing field for folks. It's not a handout, it's a vehicle. Yeah, I mean, there's not, I can't think of someone who comes into our organization um, who doesn't have to give something back to the community in order to receive whatever they're getting from us. So someone who wants to come and their child is getting Head Start education with us, 53% of our Head Start parents are taking classes with us. Some financial literacy, some English as a second language, some are taking courses through us and uh, City University um, and going on to college themselves. Even the most isolated seniors who come to us for a meal the act of coming out of their home and actually coming to get a meal for us is actually work on their part because we may be the only people they see in any given day. And they, they're contributing to that sense of community. Many of your volunteers are also drawn from the community itself. Oh, completely, both locally and all throughout the city. I mean, it used to be that the only folks that were that the Education Alliance were helping were people who lived in the immediate Lower East Side neighborhood. Now we serve a catchment area of 14th Street down south uh, to the Battery. Um, but we also have, you know, a young kid who I met the other day lives in Far Rockaway, goes to high school in Brighton Beach, but comes to us for college prep because he knows that 100% of our kids get into college. And he said, the only way I know I'm going to get into college is if I go uh, to the Educational Alliance. And so I think we're sort of this little American dream factory. We still deeply believe in the American dream. Um, we still believe it's attainable. We think everybody's dream is different. Uh, and we think the place that you can come and work on that uh, dream is the educational alliance. So talk about the idea of excellence, high standards. Talk about that combined with giving. What we hope to do is inspire people to feel like they're worthy for something better than what they have right now. So is right. it demanding through inspiration, inspiring people to step up themselves and to create their own future? I think it's to give them as many on-ramps as possible 
uh, for them to have a better life. Um, and so some people may come into us through the Head Start programs. Mm -hmm. Others may come into us uh, through one of our private preschools. Somebody may come in through us through our after school programs and then their families come in afterwards. But what we've learned at the Alliance is that one family doesn't have one problem. Right. Families have multiple problems. And you need organizations that are going to look holistically at a family and say, what do they need? Mm -hmm. um, what are their stresses right now? And then work collaboratively throughout the entire agency to sort of help that family. And I think what the Educational Alliance has done over the last 126 years is view themselves as a living laboratory. Um, where we're constantly piloting different ways to serve community. And how we did it maybe 100 years ago is different than how we did it 50 years ago is different how we did it last year. Um, and we were the first kindergarten in the city, the first Head Start in the country, the first early Head Start in the country. Three years ago, we looked at our Head Start program. We said we're serving the same families, generation after generation. It's broken. Right. Head Start hasn't been fixed since the 60s. we now part of a national pilot where our families are actually participating with the students in education. So while the kids are in school, their families are learning with us because we know if the families aren't learning, the kids won't really succeed. You know, that's an innovation on our part. Uh, we took the senior center model, we turned it on its head. We said, no one wants to go to a senior center. My God, rubber chicken, bingo, this is awful. They want to go someplace that's vibrant. They want to age like a New Yorker. How did, what does that look like exactly? Oh, I have an idea. Why don't we create centers for balanced living? Because as the baby boomer generation begins to retire, they're going to need a place to go. And so right. there's Tai Chi and meditation and lecture series and things that you sit there and go, boy, if I lived in a retirement community, this is where I'd want to go, which is why the city called us the most innovative uh, center for older adults and gave us a million dollar prize. So are you customer responsive? Oh, I think our whole business is customer facing. I think about our running a nonprofit as I think about this as running a business. And there are several businesses within the Educational Alliance. There's an early Head Start business. There's an addiction and recovery business. There's an older adult services business. And our job is to look at our customers. And the reality is, is in New York, if you don't like the service you're getting at one nonprofit organization, you can go someplace else mm -hmm. um, to get that service. And so we're competing for customers. Um, and I think how we compete for customers is being extremely customer facing and that starts with how you're greeted in the door. There's a woman who works for us um, and I've been there for a year and I found her in a cubicle and she had a job and she was a such a gregarious person. Nobody saw her. She now is downstairs greeting everybody. She knows everybody's name. She's a tenant leader in the neighborhood. And I said, I want you to be the face of who people see when they come into one of our organizations. So we think it's really important that we know our names. Our teens who come into our uh, Boys and Girls Club of America Teen Center, we have the highest average daily attendance of any clubhouse in America. Why is that the case? Because our staff knows the names of the young people that come into the building. So if you don't come for three days, somebody calls you on the telephone because they're stewarding you. Right. And they say, where are you? Everything okay? What's going on at home? We haven't seen you for a while. We're missing you. That's that relationship, that retail politics, that I just think is really important in what we do. And those are the people who then contribute back to the Absolutely. organization. Absolutely. I mean, my hope is that in terms of our young people, I don't want to send every, you know, the statistics on the Lower East Side, 34% of the kids graduate high school. That's it. 34% of the kids graduate high school. My job is not to get kids to graduate high school. My job is to radicalize those kids. I want those kids so angry about the issues that are going on inside the community, a shooting that took place two weeks ago, the fact that 50% of the young people in our neighborhood um, are living below the poverty line, more than that are on public assistance. I want those people to be so angry that they get radicalized, that they become the next city council members, community board members, they run uh, for their tenant board in their public housing complex. I want them back into the neighborhood, so going to college is a piece of it for me, but I really want to radicalize those young people. And give them the ability to, to take power themselves, to, 
to drive their own lives, to create their own businesses, to create their own careers. Right, and also to, to they're the ones who are going to be able to find the solutions to the challenges that are going on in the neighborhood. You know, I deeply believe that the solutions rest not only with the people who come into our door, but they also rest with our staff. I did an all-town staff meeting not so long ago. I said, if you think any of the great ideas about this organization's future are going to come from me, I said, you're wrong. And they're not going to come from the people who report directly to me. They're going to come from the people who every single day the rank and file staff members are facing our neighbors and providing them some sort of service. So I launched a competition uh, a month ago called the CEO's Request for Ideas Competition, where I set aside a pot of money and any staff member from the porter to the program officer could apply directly to me for a grant to better serve our community. And 26 proposals came out uh, of that competition and we selected six of them for funding. I mean I really believe that the staff are what's going to drive this organization. I think that's what makes us different also as an organization. Is that need to connect with individuals that are scattered throughout this geography the reason why you end up with 20 locations throughout this this region? Yeah, I mean demand. I mean part of it's just an you know it, the the need unfortunately is there. Right. You know, as, as government becomes more dysfunctional, <laughs> as people fight with each other more, you know, you have these parties down Over in silly, silly things. Completely silly stuff. People suffer. You know, right. and we see the income gap just grows. The need for services just grows. Um, the, uh, the graduation rates in our neighborhood haven't improved, right? And so that need still grows. And so therefore, we just end up stretching out. What we've been clear not to do is really not to go outside our ge geographic boundaries that much. So if we go into a middle school that's slightly north of our area, mm -hmm. we're only in that middle school because I want my kids in the Lower East Side to have a shot at getting into that middle school. So right. we cut deals with principals. We'll offer after school programs in your school, but you got to take some of our Lower East Side kids into your Gramercy public school. Um, and that's how we've uh, grown you know, some of our programming. Uh, talk about what informs your decision to invest in certain types of programs? Is it, is it a matter of, of demand and the volume? Is it, is it a matter of philosophy of trying to provide a whole range of different exposures as part of a way to convey a feeling of empowerment? Yeah, I mean, so it's a great question. Um, I think there are two answers to that question. The first answer is we are uh, we have a philosophy that's a holistic approach that we think if you give people a good foundation in formal education, we give people access to arts uh, and culture education. Um, if we talk constantly about wellness um, and make that part of somebody's daily uh, ecology, um, then that sets them up in life to have a good uh, foundation for their future. How I measure those programs, and we have 30 some odd programs, I've been there for a year, we created a dashboard model where every single one of our programs is on a dashboard so I can punch in any moment, take a look at a program, see how many, what our internal goals are, what our contractual obligations are, um, what are the goals we've promised externally uh, to people, and then what the business is. How many people are coming into the program? Are we meeting our goals? How do we know if we're having impact? Right? Is our theory of change being proven correct or not? Does this program even have a theory of change? Do you measure customer satisfaction? Oh, yeah. How do you do that? Well, partly um, by surveys, uh, depending on who comes in, mm -hmm. what, what the program is. You also can tell, right, if you have a fitness center, which is, and you have an attrition rate of 40%, I'm wondering why people aren't, you know, coming why back. are people le coming back? People are bringing their friends. You know that you're offering a good service. I think what we've done very smartly, and I don't take credit for this, I think this is you know, before my time, mm -hmm. um, was that many settlement houses have 90% of their funding coming from government. Right. Our funding, only 42% of our funding comes from government, 30% come from fees and services, and the remainder comes from private philanthropy. So we have done, I think, a remarkably good job and, and thoughtful job of trying to create an organization where New York's well-to-do middle class and low-income New Yorkers would all want to come into the same building. And I often say that our Manny Canner Center, which is our flagship building on the corner of East Broadway and Jefferson, is as egalitarian as a Costco, right? You know, you get hedge fund folks coming in there, but you also have someone coming in from public housing. Right. And that's our job. 
You've talked a bit about your staff. Talk about the board. Many organizations that come out of a particular uh, tradition, Catholic traditions or Jewish traditions or whatever, um, still have boards that are dominated by those traditional adherents. How, how does your board look? And I think our board is still primarily a Jewish board, but it's evolving. Um, it's not exclusively Jewish, and I think we've made a particular effort now uh, to uh, broaden out the group of people who uh, would participate at the board level. A lot of the things that I'm having conversations about right now is the different ways you could participate with the Educational Alliance without being a board member. Mm -hmm. um, so we created Friends of the Educational Alliance, which will uh, unveil in the next several weeks, and Nikki Russ Fetterman, the fourth generation owner of Russ and Daughter Appetizing uh, on the Lower East Side, a, you know, a venerable Lower East Side institution, is gonna chair the group. Um, the idea is to bring the next generation of New York leadership into these organizations. So you have a governance body, but then you also have a friends of body, which is uh, primarily a friend making, fundraising type of type of a uh, of a group. Totally, it's all about leveraging. Right. Right. Donors come and they say, "Who's supporting this organization?" So to be a friends of, you have to make a gift, um, whatever's personally significant to you, and you have to let us leverage your name. Um, those are the two requirements of being a friends of. So you're, you're creating a, a rather interesting response to the challenge of transforming and bringing in new and fresh talent. 60-year-old New Yorkers and north of 60, they have their established charities. Right. They have the things and causes that they believe in and that they're really concerned about. I'm really interested, you know, from a strategic point of view of, of, of thinking about the 40-somethings and the 50-somethings, those who are just starting to make it in their career, those who now start having a little bit more money, a little more time to serve on uh, right. on boards or to serve in the organization. And so we're making a specific play to looking for the next generation of New York leadership. What's next for the Educational Alliance? I think it's two pieces. Um, first is we're going to begin a, a full-scale organizational review to take a look at all 30-some out of our programs and see whether or not they're meeting the expectations that we have, whether there's still a need for them. And I probably think over the course of the next few years, you'll see the organization probably right-size itself a little bit, um, maybe do fewer things, um, maybe try to do them uh, a little better than we're currently doing them. So we're gonna have a very introspective look to it. At the same time, I call it renovating a cruise ship while it's at sea, right? We're going to be um, doing a little more advocacy. You know, I think we do, a, and, and other similar organizations do a great job about uh, taking care of people when they're vulnerable. Do a lousy job about talking about why they're vulnerable in the first place. I don't think you can actually be a responsible social service organization in this time and not talk about why people are poor, not talk about why kids are uh, getting a lousy education. Uh, I think it's really incumbent upon all of us to be able to both deliver service and to advocate. We actually have policy ideas about how to improve our communities. Unfortunately, the relationship with government makes us, you know, neuters our ability to somehow speak out about that. I think you're gonna see us speak out more forcefully. So in many respects, you are looking at your impact and you wish to evolve your impact. So to evolve your impact, you have to do different things. To do different things, you have to change. Do some things less, do other things more. So you're engaged in a dance of creative destruction and recreation in order to keep you as current as possible and preferably get, get ahead of the curve. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're, if we're not generative, Right. If you're not fresh. You're dead. Right. I mean, the organization's been around for 126 years. It hasn't been around for 126 years because it did the exact same thing and, and had the same product on the market um, and the same service on the market for that period of time. It's been around for 126 years and well-funded for 126 years because we're constantly thinking about what the community looks like, what their needs are, how best can we serve them, and whether we're serving them you know, in the right way, whether or not we're actually having an impact. Um, and if you aren't doing those things, I think you go away. And if you're a business that doesn't reinvent, then you do go away, inevitably. Right, and I think our job of, of an organization that, you know, 
that, that at one point had a social work bent, I'm trying to put a little bit more of a business bent on it. Right. And I really do think of this as being a business. I mean, you don't have a $40 million organization um, and, and, and think of it in a loosey-goosey way. I mean, this really is a business and we're accountable about how we spend our money. Alan Bad Capel, thank you so much for describing the work of the Educational Alliance in the Lower East Side and thank you so much for your insights. Thanks for having me.